Hey, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. My guest today is Todd Sohn joining us uh, from New York at Strategic, Strategus Research Partners. Uh, the S&P finishing essentially flat for the day, really chopping around, finishing low uh, after uh, afternoon, a, a little bit higher. But overall, it's really sort of a churn and burn sort today. Utilities leading the way higher. Healthcare consumer discretionary at the bottom, underperforming even energy. So what does this mean for the long-term picture? We'll hear what Todd and, uh, and the charts have to say. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we make sense of these markets through the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, data visualization, you know, the real benefit of charting the markets, charting uh, trading activity is to visualize investor psychology and vis visualize investor behavior, but identify trends, anticipate when they're, uh, when they're turning, when they're evolving, and in general, follow the trends uh, as best as you can. And no time better than now when you have increased volatility, increased uncertainty, now is the time to certainly be reflecting on how charts can be impactful in your decision-making process. You know, a little later, we've got a great guest, uh, Todd Stone, today. A little later in the show, we're going to do a segment called Mindful Investor. I'll share with you some general things that I've come up with, uh, you know, over the years working with uh, financial advisors, institutional investors, um, just to give you a sense of some some ways that you can start to uh, upgrade your, your decision-making using some uh, lessons from, uh, from some other disciplines. I mentioned Todd Sohn from Strategus today. Tomorrow, uh, sorry, excuse me, this is next Tuesday on the 29th. We have Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners. On Wednesday, John Kosar from Asbury Research in Chicago. And then on Thursday, coming on the show for the first time, Guy Serendolo from, uh, from Boston. He runs Serendolo Research, and I follow Guy and his work uh, for a number of years. I miss being in town with, uh, in Boston with guys like Guy and be able to grab lunch and, and talk markets, but it'll be great to re, uh, reconnect with him on the show. So, you know, as we're thinking about this market environment, it's all, it's been all about the, you know, uncertainty, the, the, uh, um, the, the, the volatility, the increased, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, decision making, I guess we have to make in terms of what the next direction should be. And I've heard at times it feels like the, the game is never easy, but there are times when I feel like everyone's sort of piling on one side or the other. Here, I think there's sort of a quite a differentiation between some strategists, traders, investors, sort of, you know, doubling down on the buy the dip sort of idea, thinking anything down here is a great opportunity to buy, you know, great companies at a discount and ride the next wave higher. And there are others that, uh, you know, my guest yesterday comes to mind, uh, Leslie Jufla showing us the broadening top pattern, which, you know, could measure down to S&P 2000. And then there are plenty in the middle that see us sort of chopping around and, and churning around these current levels. The best tools we have are looking at the charts to try to uh, understand the trends and how they're evolving. So let's get to it. The S&P essentially finished flat for the day. It's up about 0.3%, just below 32, uh, 32.50. But I consider today more of a choppy sideways day, especially after yesterday's uh, sell-off. So this certainly felt like a pause, sort of a bit of a lick the wounds day. And, and I think uh, tomorrow going into the weekend, we'll see how the week finishes. We'll look at the long-term model uh, tomorrow in the show and, uh, and see how Friday's close locks in uh, a potential sell signal. Mid caps flat as well. Small caps, the best performer out of the, uh, of the group, up half a percent. Um, so again, not any huge movements uh, around the board overall. Everything finishing essentially flat. The VIX essentially the same around 2860. Bonds finished a little bit stronger with the TLT uh, closing above yesterday. The dollar was flat, although that, that theme of the strengthening dollar is certainly something that uh, to be aware of if you've, uh, if you've missed that up until now. You know, precious metals have been, have been relatively weaker and the last couple of days have been tough. It's been a tough week with, you know, breaking down key support levels. It came up, uh, up back a, a little bit uh, with gold finishing about a third of a percent higher, silver almost 2% higher. Um, so we'll look at some of those charts and, uh, and see what we think. Looking at a daily chart of the S&P 500, we're sort of right in, you know, the kill zone. We're right in that level that I think many would have expected, myself included, the very first 
you know, sort of level of support was around 3350. That was the swing low from August. And, you know, Charles Dow taught us 100 odd years ago, an uptrend is a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. As long as that pattern continues, the trend is, is up by definition. That changed here the second week in September when we broke down through that recent swing low. And now we have a short term pattern of lower highs and lower lows. In, in some cases, this is kind of easy on the tactical time frame because I've now connected the high from the first week in September, the swing high we made uh, last week. And now we sort of have this downward trajectory, sort of tracking the pace of this downtrend. And as long as we remain below that trend line, the short term trend is lower. The question now is, when do we determine, determine this is more of a long term, more of a deeper uh, uh, you know, uh, downside move that we want to be prepared for. You know, 3,200 is sort of that level for me. And there's this blue shaded area, which is around 3,200 to 3,240 or so. And where that starts is the peak from June that lined up when we finally broke through to new highs about six, five, six weeks later, we pulled back right to 3,200. And that's when we moved higher. So I think as we've now come back into that range, we're right at that point where either this holds and we break above trendline resistance or we break down to new uh, to new swing lows. Now there are of course plenty of other levels to look at, and the next one would be down in this area, which is the 200-day moving average, just above 3,100. It's down to 3,050, which would be the first Fibonacci support level based on this uh, downtrend. And that would be the next logical thing I would be I would be sort of uh, sort of looking at. But overall, if we break 3,200, I think you really need to start thinking about the potential for further downside. How you would how you'd want to be positioned for that sort of thing, and just you know, where you would start to uh, think about opportunities to, uh, to revisit uh, pushing back to the upside. Now, we've talked about some of the other, uh, other markets, and this is the uh, chart list that I use uh, for intermarket analysis, sort of hitting on some of the key themes out there. We talked about the strengthening dollar. Dollar is essentially flat, but here's the dollar index uh, through yesterday. This is not updated for today, but it's essentially right around those same levels. You know, one of the big themes we've talked about in terms of how things are shifting right now is this downtrend in the dollar we've in the dollar we've seen really since uh, since late March, mid late March, when really came off those extreme high levels, and then really has been this uh, consistent downward trend, and that's changed now. We finally have a uh, a higher low, a higher high, and it's rotating back above the 50-day moving average for the first time since mid May. That's a real change of configuration, and again. You know, it's not a vacuum. It's not like you can say, I would love to tell you stronger dollar means X, Y, Z, all these things will happen. You can look at historical tendencies and you can see what's tended to happen in a stronger dollar environment. So for example, small caps in general tend to do better. U.S. tends to do better in the non-U.S. Uh, markets. Uh, but again, the charts are what is going to tell you what's actually happening. But the bullish divergence we saw going into the lows there the first week in September, I think now validated suggesting I, I'm certainly expecting more of a stronger dollar environment here for the foreseeable future. And, and again, that's something to think about when you're looking at, uh, looking at different uh, uh, allocations that you might have. In terms of sector movements today, again, defense really led with utilities and then consumer staples one and two. Materials number three, and that relative strength of materials and industrials is a theme that emerged. And the fact that materials were managed to outperform today, I think is pretty positive. Industrials were the other one, the two of those have been have been strong sectors and uh, you know charts like uh, FDX come to mind uh, Federal Express within industrials uh, Freeport Macquarie and other uh, names within materials that had been doing very very well uh, that theme and whether those sectors are able to hold some key levels I think is an important one uh, to watch but this certainly saw the uh, saw an improvement in utilities and staples today on the downside we have healthcare we talked about some big pharma names yesterday in particular I think we looked at Merck in the last day or two. And again, the sector as a whole uh, weakening off there. You know, with all of these sector movements, I think, you know, we, we talk about them in this way because I you know a lot of advisors, a lot of investors think about sector allocations and, and, and as, a, as a bet, some sort of, uh, you know, sector model that you might be looking at. But I would, I would certainly tell you now more than ever, uh, you know, when, when I call it something like a stock picker's market, I'm, I'm pointing out that within a sector like financials or industrials or materials, even if the whole sector looks a certain way, there are pockets within any of those sectors I just, I just named that are, are outliers that look better than average and there are stocks that look worse than average. And if you can focus on some of these key sectors and focus in particular on the names that are looking better than average, I think you're gonna be in good shape overall. You'll be able to weather this sort of environment. And we talked yesterday about a basket of stocks that were able to relatively outperform. And that's certainly where I would, uh, I would think of uh, starting to look. 
As we wrap up this market recap, I just wanted to point out in terms of uh, sector improvements, gold miners back in the top 10. We haven't seen mining stocks and gold miners up here uh, very often, up over 2% today. And uh, you know, three of the top 10 uh, industry groups all within the materials sector. That's probably why that looks uh, pretty good. But also automobiles, which includes uh, Tesla, which is our top ranked stock, according to the Scooter large cap rankings. Also home construction, which includes the, uh, the home builders uh, and others. On the downside, you had plenty of, uh, of groups that struggled. I think noteworthy would be airlines. That's a group a lot of people have talked about because indus industrials as a whole have started to improve. But airlines, I, I think, have continued to struggle. Uh, transportation services. We talked yesterday about Dow theory and the relationship between industrials, uh, Dow industrials and the Dow transports. And I think transports as a whole, when you think about transportation services, airlines as being components of that, it's certainly continuing to uh, indicate that non-confirmation where the Dow transports and industrials are starting to uh, roll over in tandem here. It'll be key to see if they are able to hold support levels of breakdown. At this point, it certainly feels like we're breaking down rather than holding up. I want to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be back with my guest, Todd Sohn. We'll see you in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We love to hear from you. Uh, love to hear questions that you're running into as you go through this process of analyzing your own charts and, uh, and themes that you're paying attention to. You can get help from us anytime in terms of, uh, of questions we can answer. Uh, one is via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, or just put a comment below any of our uh, videos on our YouTube channel. We'll gather all of those. We have another mailbag segment coming up uh, at the end of the week. We'd love to answer one of your questions live on the air. I want to welcome on my guest, Todd Sohn from Strategus Research Partners in New York. Todd, it's great to have you back on the show. As I mentioned in the introduction, you know, we're having this situation where, you know, the market's clearly pulled back. We've seen the big mega cap tech leadership sort of names rolling over. And the question is, are we expecting further downside or is this more of a, uh, a dip that we want to be looking more opportunistically on the ups upside? Welcome to the show. Let me let me know where where you're at with all of this. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I appreciate you uh, having me on as always. And so I, I'd say big picture. Let's keep in mind that the S&P is coming off of what's basically been a 64% run over the last six months, right? And one of the best in history. Now, tactically, yeah, you're going to see a pullback, right? And that's what we're in right now. Yeah. I think that's okay. And so when we start to enter this environment of correcting, consolidating, we got to go to our tactical indicators. And one of those is the percentage of stocks hitting a new one month low. I'd also say the percentage of stocks above their 50 day average, these become very timely once you start to see pullbacks occur. And I'd say with regards to the percentage of stocks at a 20 minute, 20 day low, that spiked uh, this week to above 50%. And historically, that is a pretty good sign that we're closer to the end rather than the beginning of a correction and that the probabilities are in our favor to step in and start to nibble at this dip to start to buy the dip. Uh, there's there's been misses right before, uh, namely say in 2018, and so if you don't get a response here over the next couple of weeks, then that'd be a little bit more troubling for us. Got it. So tactically, that's actually really interesting. We've come off in a similar way that sort of tactical pullbacks within longer term trends. Where it's, it sounds like we're sort of at that sweet spot to determine whether you know whether this is something that's viable or whether we whether we continue lower. Now you know you I, I, when I think of you and your work at Strategus, it's a lot about breadth, and I always love the themes you would come up with. Here we're looking at equal weighted S&P and I, you know, immediately starting to compare this to the cap weighted S&P. What does the equal weighted S&P tell you? Right. So let's just say we get an oversold response and we resume higher. The key gauge for participation though on a new leg up is the equal weighted S&P for us because you could get just Apple, Microsoft, Amazon to lift the index higher uh, as, as I think we're used to. 
So we like to gauge what the equal eight, the average S&P stock is doing for particip participation. And if this fails to make a new high, or if it, it starts to continue to roll over here as the cap weight index uh, resumes higher, that's when big problems happen. Because we need to know what's going on under the surface because the indices lie, especially now given how overweight they are to tech and growth, those type of uh, names here. So this is a very important chart to monitor for what participation looks like on any sort of response here heading into the fourth quarter. So, you know, you bring up this, this idea of, you know, obviously we're, we're sort of setting the stage for a fourth quarter, which could be a fascinating market environment for sure. You mentioned, you know, the mega cap leadership tech and, and others that, that got us to this point. There's the whole work from home trade, things like the Zoom and Peloton types of names that, you know, sort of emerged out of nowhere and became bellwethers of sorts. But then you have things like materials and industrials that started to emerge, you know, leading into, uh, into the recent couple of weeks. You know, when you're looking opportunistically now, where are you pointing people to start to think if you had new money today? Where, where would you be looking for opportunities? It, it is, it's, it's industrials, it's materials, it is non-Amazon discretionary in some areas. And the idea behind that is those are groups and sectors that are coming out of a two and a half year bear market. In a lot of cases, many bellwether stocks peaked in January of 2018 and they have yet to recover those highs. And, we, and when we think of the decline you saw in March, we're of the view that that was the punctuation of that bear market, right? That was the end of it. Uh, the waterfall move and the response we've seen then is them, it, it, uh, then are those stocks coming out of those bear markets. And so they've had a great run here in the last six months, but they really haven't done anything these last few years. So we think you can use these corrections here to start adding in, especially if you want to get away from, if you're too overweight tech and you'd like to lighten up your exposure there. Uh, still very timely opportunities in industrials and materials and, and names like that. It's a perfect day. We only have about 30 seconds left, but I'd love to ask you, Todd, when you, when you think of the chart of the S&P 500, when you think about differentiating a deeper pullback versus something more, you know, maybe more, more short term, you know, is there a particular level or a particular uh, signal that you would see on a chart of the S&P or is it confirmation from something like breadth in some form that would tell you this isn't, you know, for, for certain, according to our toolkit, it's not anything short term. This is really going to be something, you know, bigger, deeper, longer. Is there some sort of signal level pattern that you would be looking for here? I, th I think if you don't get the response from these oversold conditions we're starting to see, and then if we had to add a level to it, if you start to undercut 3,000 on S and the S&P, then, mm -hmm. then there's trouble brewing, and you're probably going to see it in that equal weight S&P too. I'm going to guess that's going to be lower by that point. Uh, so keep those two in tandem uh, for, for how things look over the next couple of months. That's fantastic. Todd, those are a couple of really good charts, and I appreciate your answering the questions as well. Hope you and the family in New York stay safe, and uh, we'll keep in touch, all right? You too. Thanks, Dave. That was Todd Sohn joining us from Strategus Research Partners. I enjoyed following Todd and, uh, and Chris Verone, the, the technical team at Strategus, for a number of years. They do a fantastic job for, uh, for institutions, and what a pleasure to have them on the show and, uh, and give sort of their latest take, what they're telling uh, their, uh, their followers to, uh, to be looking at. Our next segment is called The Mindful Investor. You know, if you watch the show with some regularity, you've probably picked, on on my not, picked up on my not-so-subtle thoughts related to mindfulness and, and discipline and taking the emotions out of the decision. We really focus on the show on, you know, the charts and thinking about, you know, the practical, actionable uh, things to, to think about. But, you know, a lot of the work that I do outside of the fine of our ends up focusing really on developing good routines, good systems, and it's building on a lot of the stuff we talk about uh, talk about uh, on the normal normal show. So what we wanted to do is just uh, take a few moments and and address sort of this concept of uh, mindful investing. We've teased on some of these concepts at different times, and uh, we'll uh, we'll spend a couple minutes on that today. You know, I found for me one of my favorite things to do is take lessons and experiences outside of investing and apply it to what we're doing inside the investment landscape. And you know, again, some of the richest, most fascinating conversations I've had with others in the industry usually don't have to do with stocks. It's about aviation or music or reading or uh, you know, so sailing or some, some other thing that you're doing outside of investing because there are so many places where we make decisions. Our investment decisions are just one type of decision that we make 
in the normal course of, our, of a day or normal co course of our lives. And so thinking about what allows us to make good decisions elsewhere, a lot of times we can apply those same concepts to, uh, to investing. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to fly a Cessna 172R and I, I phrase it that way because I am certainly not done yet. I have a lot more to learn. Uh, but I've spent most of my time flying uh, in the Boston area. And this was a, a moment of, uh, and I guarantee I was being very safe uh, at the time, uh, honey, as I was doing this, uh, talking to my wife. But, uh, but overall, this was a, just a, a free moment uh, after one of the longest uh, the legs that I had flown. And I finally was able to navigate back to my home airport with success. I'd done all the necessary things, so um, did a quick selfie in midair. But I wanted to share with you a couple of things that, it, that occurred to me as I was learning to fly and how they related to good decision making as an investor. The first one involves checklists. I always tell my, when my wife would get nervous about me going up in the air, I would tell her, listen, if you check the car as, as thoroughly as we check the airplane every time we get in it, it's like a 200 point checklist just to get behind the controls of the airplane. So the chances of something going wrong in midair are actually minimal. The, the chances of, I mean, the, 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 the unfortunately uh, reality of it is most uh, private pilot incidents are due to human error. It's rarely something wrong with the airplane. It's usually something wrong with the pilot and, you know, being, you know, somehow unable to make the right decision at the right time. So most of what you are trained for is to make good decisions and to take emotions out of it. When you're, when you're getting your plane up in the air, the very last thing you do before you engage the propeller is you get to this point on your checklist where you flick on the master switch, turn your beacon on, you open the throttle and the mixture and the fuel pump are all related to the fuel system, and then you yell out the window and you fire up the, uh, the propeller. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the propeller starts just like you would expect because you've, again, gone through every system and you've made sure mechanically electronically, the plane's ready to fly. And so you're, you're minimizing the chance of something going wrong. But it's so funny when I talk to people that are using stock charts and going through their decision-making process, starting to pick that apart, um, I find that there could, there, there's certainly some opportunity to create a more systematic, more disciplined way of making decisions. So this is the technical checklist that I actually have taught at the college level. I taught at Brandeis University for a number of years and would tell people or it would help students understand how to make decisions using charts. And we would, through the course of the semester, build up a seven point decision process, a decision tree. And it starts with Dow theory. If you've watched the show, you hear how many times in an hour and 30 minutes I say higher highs and higher lows. I say it incessantly and, uh, uh, and, and the reason is because that's what Charles Dow taught us. He said an uptrend is a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. And that's what means the stock is going up. And, and it's so funny how often we look at a chart and forget to just make that very simple, basic and incredibly important assessment because everything else comes from that starting point. Even candlestick patterns are all about the trend leading up to the candle pattern. So you better understand the trend first off. Then it's looking at trend lines, moving averages, price patterns, any key support and resistance levels, confirmation, which would be things like RSI, PPO, MACD, those sorts of indicators, and then relative strength. How does this chart relate to the other charts you could be looking at? And what I teach students is once you've answered those seven questions, you have then earned the right to say, I'm bullish or bearish, or to say buy or sell. Until you've done that, uh, you, you have not earned the right to do so. so as you're looking at this checklist, my question for you, what is your checklist as you develop your you know, decision, as you make a decision on a chart? How often do you just sort of glide through this in a very soft, fluid way and sort of look at the chart and decide what to do as opposed to really systematically going through there? Now, the longer you do this, you sort of internalize the systematic part of it and you naturally are addressing each of these issues. But especially as you're getting started, I would encourage you to write down your checklist and literally check things off one by one as you evaluate a chart and you will find some of those potential misses that you're able to uh, eliminate. Question or, or I guess point number two is what I call situational awareness, which is basically pilots are taught to have a deep awareness of what's going on around you as a, you know, inside the cockpit and outside the cockpit. And you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, charting and, and the uh, chart list feature on stock charts. It's all related to developing a good market awareness or a good situational awareness. As an investor, I think you're, you're well off, you're well informed if you know through the universe of potential investments you could, uh, you could, you could uh, dig into today, 
what's working and what isn't, what trends are positive, what trends are negative, what trends are sideways, and being able to categorize those, whether it's a mechanical model-based approach or a very subjective chart-oriented approach. And I use a little of both, but I certainly lean more visual chart uh, subjectively oriented. And so my process involves a regular daily routine called the morning coffee routine, a regular weekly routine that I do starting Thursday and going into Monday every week. It allows me to follow the same set of charts every time. And what happens is it is very difficult to not be aware of the situation around you as an investor. So in an airplane, you're looking at a panel like this and you have to make a quick, quick assessment of where you're at. My question to you is, what do you look at using charting platforms, using stock charts to be able to answer the question of what's working and what isn't? And finally, I'll tell you, uh, you know, flying and aviating is all about having an emergency plan always in place. And this is uh, later after that uh, shot of my, my, uh, myself that I showed you earlier. This is off the right wing tip. This is showing Providence, Rhode Island and Providence Harbor here on the right. And while I was enjoying that view off the right wing tip, I also knew that North Central Airport was off my left wing tip, which is this little X that you see here. And I knew given my altitude, given the wind conditions, if I would lose my engine right at that moment, I knew how to make a banking uh, left turn. I knew how to get to the right um, uh, runway. I knew what uh, frequency I needed to talk to other pilots because uh, I had written it on my knee pad. So even though things were great and everything was just fine, I had my emergency plan in mind. And so given the market uncertainty, given the pullback, and again, given Todd Soane's comments and others we've talked about, about weakening breath conditions, about lines in the sand at which, which you might expect further downside, the question is now, while the downside has been relatively cushioned, relatively minimal, now is the time to define your levels of risk and determine what your exit strategy should be. It's not when things really start to get worse from here. Now is the time, if not yesterday, is the time to do that sort of thing. So that's a segment, Mindful Investor, where we just try to tease out some of the, uh, some of the lessons uh, of, of, uh, of applying uh, better decision making to, uh, to your own process. I hope that was helpful and gave you some food for thought. We need to wrap up the show and go right to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is looking at the small cap index, IWM is the small cap ETF. And the reason why I'm showing you this is the pink lines that you see here are taking the Fibonacci retracements from the low in March to the high that we saw in August. And as you can see, we're now testing the 200 day moving average. We've been above it since early July. And so breaking back below it would, uh, would certainly be a, a downside violation. The RSI is already below 40, which tells me this is more in bearish mode than bullish mode, all else being equal. So the question is what next? I think just like we're talking about S&P 3200, S&P 3000, I think with the uh, small cap ETF, you can look down here around 135. That would be a 38.2% retracement of this uptrend. It would also be the lower end of this congestion pattern that we saw off of the June uh, high. Between here and then, that's sort of the support that you would most likely expect if we break through the 200 day, which uh, has not been done on a closing basis just yet. So that would, that's the first thing. But if we get down there, that's where I would be looking for support. If that holds, that could be the rotation higher as things start to improve going into year end. If we break that though, I think that's when you start needing to looking at much deeper potential downside and just thinking about how to manage that risk in your, uh, in your portfolio and in your thinking. Chart number two is the US dollar. We talked about this earlier in this rotation from a distribution phase to an accumulation phase. And that's just a transition from lower highs and lower lows to higher highs and higher lows. And again, there are some normal expectations you can make based on market history and based on the implications of a stronger dollar environment. Based on this transition, I think uh, you know, it certainly would, would expect further upside in the dollar from here. That tends to have implications for small cap performance, tends to have implications for uh, U.S. versus non-U.S. stocks. But again, the charts are what you need to follow more than that. And just understanding what that's going to mean uh, for your, uh, your portfolio as well. Finally, the HYG, which is the high yield ETF. If you remember back here, this is when the Fed talked about, uh, you know, buying directly into the ETF market, buying this uh, HYG and high yield uh, bond ETFs. This is that huge jump that you saw the gap in April. You know, the, the reason why this is an interesting chart, it is also broken down. 84 was a pretty key level. That was the low from uh, early September, also similar to the low we had in August. And it lines up with the June market peak. We've now broken down through that level. And for me, I'm starting to look down at Fibonacci levels and 200 day moving averages. But this is an interesting chart to look at because the Fed has taken action in there before, if and when they determine they need to uh, to get started. My friend Matt Maley at Miller Tabak pointed out some really good thoughts about the high yield ETF. And I think he's uh, he's spot on with the value of looking at the HYG and thinking about 
uh, where you might want to uh, recognize that, uh, that uh, the Fed could be taking action in a place like that. Folks, that's our show for today. Really enjoy you joining us every weekday for the final bar. All of our previous shows on our YouTube channel, so check them out. I want to thank my guest, Todd Sohn from Strategus Partners, joining us from New York, sharing his thoughts on market breadth and potential downside, also potential for upside. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.